Well, I think uh, you all may have read that uh, during the internet boom, you know, so everybody wants to get into the internet business. So was I. And uh, uh, during that time, uh, I did some. I did a very silly thing. You see. I went and sold my stake in DG. You know. <laughs> <laughs> A silly would be an understatement. <laughs> I saw it when it was around 6 billion valuation, today it's 45 billion. So it's not silly, I think it's really stupid. Huh? <laughs> so, so then I had some uh, uh, extra cash, a bit of cash here and there. So, um, uh, quite a few people approached me, I'm investing. So, you know, and then I was reading, uh, well, one of the things that I do is you know, I read a lot. Uh, I'm trying to make up for not going to, uh, not being able to go to a university. So I read a lot. I read all kinds of stuff. So, so we get. So you see, Bajaya is a very unfocused group. We invest everything from A to Z. So usually, my friend asks me, those who know me afterwards, okay, which business are you all not in? <laughs> That's the shorter answer, right? They don't ask which business you are in. <laughs> Take too long. So, <clears throat> uh, so like I said, uh, I read a lot, diversified interests, so we get involved in many things. Not very focused. It's good and bad. Uh, it's good when uh, if you are in industry that is in recession during that time, and then you've got other businesses that's doing well, so it's okay. So it's like Malaysia, you know. Uh, diversified economy, you don't know, rely only on one thing. So we have many things. And uh, so I thought internet would be a good area to invest. And uh, so I get to meet people and it's always introduced by people who know, uh, know my people, sometimes know my family members. So I hear them out and I was, I put out a lot of money. I think probably invested in 20 over ventures. Maybe I invested 200 over million, 200 million. Uh, so the one, a few good ones. Uh, luckily, some uh, two or maybe three or four made it. Uh. One is uh, of course uh, Ganesh one is the most famous, and then uh, there's this kinetic. You know, it's a dot com registrar that does quite well. Uh, it actually does very well, but it's a bit more low profile. And then there's some other software things I invested, also low profile. And uh, so maybe about four or five. Of course, the Ganesh one is the uh, one that did uh, very well. And uh, I invested, when I met Ganesh, he was 19 years old. Uh, so I hear his story and I agreed to donate to, uh, well, sorry, I agreed. <laughs> Invest, invest two million. No, that's why we shouldn't ask for angel investor. We should ask for angel donation. <laughs> so I, I invested two million with Ganesh, and uh, well, originally they actually asked for four million. But after you go through all the thing, you know actually two million will do. And uh, when after I agreed, I said okay, agreed, and then I said I write you the check. I write the wrote the check. Ganesh went back, told his mom he's quitting university immediately because he just got two million. <laughs> so I thought Ganesh, that's the smartest thing you have done. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there are no university guys here. <laughs> um, maybe I was sour grape no, because I couldn't go to university, so I think everyone should go. <laughs> so, so. Uh, <clears throat> I invested two million Ganesh and uh, over the years, but you know the word angel, you know, angel is a messenger of God. Uh, we all know different religion, whether it's Muslim or Christian, angel, you know, you got all angels by many names. Yeah. So uh, angel investor is a very, very, uh, what shall I say, as a generous term for, for these investors. Because not all investors are angel. <laughs> they may start angelic, you know, and along the way, they may turn out to be <laughs> the angel you don't want to meet. So I think Ganesh was quite lucky because over the over the years, you know, if two million would have just had been it, 
that would be nice. But today, MOL is worth, we're going to take it for listing. I think it's worth about a billion. We just got a valuation. It's over more than a billion ringgit. But over the years, I've invested actually almost uh, 80 to 90 million in MOL. But it's in and out. Like, you know, we put in, we take back. Uh, you know, you know, we private, we lease it. Yes. You know, for I remember 35 million because all these young fellows say, "Oh, I must lease." So okay, <laughs> we we'll lease it 35 million, and then we bought it back for 65. You know, we do all these kind of silly things. I, I do that all the time. <laughs> So we go and value it 35 million, that's every pay and a little buy it back from them for 65 million after three years. So those who bought actually they doubled their money, almost doubled their money. Yeah, but then we decided that if we don't privatize it, this there is not really going anywhere. So we privatize it and then our focus and of course along the years we invest more. Uh, like I said, uh, for example we bought uh, in, we bought many different, different, invest different, different things. So MOL becomes an angel company itself, like, you know, investing in different things, but most of the time, of course, Ganesh come and convince me, and uh, we discuss, but of course, uh, not, I mean, he convinced me, I must be convinced, and I think, okay, we'll put a couple million here, a couple of million there, so we keep doing things. So over the years, uh, up to now, for example, in all night, we bought into Friendster. That was a deal that needs to be done very fast, like, you know, a week or so, and come and pop. Uh, this bunch of investors or uh, these angels of uh, Friendster, they've been there so long losing money. So, uh, they need a lot of guts to invest in that because they make, they lost, uh, they have a loss of average about 10 to 12 million US, you know, not ringgit a year. So I said, okay, we buy this, how are we going to make it work? Uh, so they have so many members, you know, they're 140 million, big numbers, but active one is. At that time, I was told it's about 40. And then, of course, it goes down. Like, as Facebook grow bigger, it goes down. So, probably maybe, and today I understand it's about 4 million active members. But when we bought it, we said 12 million. How did they lose 12 million? Because they have an office in the US, they have an office in Sydney, they have an office in Singapore. So, we said, okay, we went through the numbers and said, okay, first thing we and then they have a big office, would you believe it, in Philippines. Have the most employees in Philippines. That was the smartest thing they did. So we say we went through the thing and said, okay, we will cut. We will close. We will close US office. We close Sydney. And then we remove a few overpaid people in Singapore. We cut down almost 9 million or 10 million. So it's almost, uh, I think this year is uh, good. It's, well, now this last year we lost a million, I think, and this year we'll probably it's going to make break even. But that wasn't the greatest thing. The greatest thing is got a bunch of patents that we could, you know, do some deal with uh, this big company and then they give us their share. And then in the end, we did very well. Yeah. So we were, can be, we are lucky. La. We are lucky. Okay. That's uh, very honest. Honest of you to admit. <laughs> <laughs> we were lucky. Uh, but of course, we also knew those things, those things were there, you know. So those things have got some value, but we don't really know how valuable it is. Like. Sometimes, you know, you buy a bunch of things, you know, suddenly you go and look into the cupboard, something that could be more valuable than the things that you are thinking about, you know. So we were lucky. And uh, so that's, and then we are doing more things, like, for example, uh, because I told Ganesh, you should be, should make MOL, should go into every continent uh, in the world. So you go to Latin America, so we're doing that. You should go to Europe, so it's buying a big uh, company in Turkey, which is the biggest in the same business. And, uh, and it's in India, Vietnam, everywhere, and also buying a, you know. So, so MOL will be a very interesting company. So we thought after we do this, uh, we'll probably take it and lease it back in KL in Busan, Malaysia, you know, so we thought we should uh, support Malaysia more and listen in Malaysia. So that's what we are doing with this. And uh, so what I want to say is this, you know, uh, some words of uh, advice. Uh, 
you see, uh, Friendster was very interesting that there was Philippines, you know, because the wages is so much lower in uh, compared to whether US or Sydney or, or Singapore or even here. You know, the people are paid much lower than even in Malaysia. So sometimes you start business, everybody wants uh, big pay or the current pay that they're getting and all this. It's very hard to want. Uh, so when you start a new business, just like when I started business, I mean, I come from a poor family. <coughs> you really have to rough it out. Uh. So my word of advice is, uh, when you start business, you know, if you get paid 50,000 somewhere, you want to start a business, don't expect 50,000, the company pay you 50,000 then. We get a few more followers like that, the company go bust very fast, <laughs> you know. So, so cost is very important. And sometimes if we, you know, Malaysia also cost is going up. You know, for example, I know the telco sector, my God, everybody's pinching everybody. And they're doubling their salary, in giving 50% increase. Soon it'll be crazy. You know, so things like that. And, uh, and uh, what else? Um, So we need to stay competitive. Lah. We need to stay competitive. Competitiveness is very important. And one of the thing, one of the sad thing that is uh, affecting us is the standard of English is. What should I say? It's terrible, terrible, pathetic. Um, you pity those uh, people who don't have the opportunity, like. All these guys here in the room, all you guys have opportunity like this. My, you know, though I study up to form five, huh? but I went to English medium school, and my Malay is also pretty good. My only regret is I didn't go to a Chinese school, so I don't know Chinese. <laughs> and uh, but you know, if you are Chinese, so we can speak. I can speak Mandarin. You know, can get by la, You know, cannot engage in a serious Conversation. business discussion. La, you know. Uh, that's it, just let me, sorry, I will ask you, uh, sorry, if I can just have, we have to share one mic, lah. this mic is not uh, giving too much kickback. I guess when you talk, you said earlier that you follow, you read a lot, right? So you, is that how you follow developments in technology or or now, I, I guess in the last three years, because you've got Ganesh there and he, you know, he will, you can bounce things off you or he will tell opportunities when he sees them to you, you know? How is that balance? Because I did, I remember you once, you told me early on you read a lot. And I'm surprised. So what kind of technology reading you do, if any? <coughs> no, I read widely and sometimes if I read something interesting, very often I tell Ganesh, you know, you should go and look at this. For example, there's this young man in uh, Bang Bangalore that is doing this stuff, you know, you go and have a look. You know, whether we can, you know, go and uh, put some money with him and stuff like this. So when I read, I, you know, I was probably send him a short SMS, look at this, look at that. And sometimes he sent me stuff, then we, you know, we read, we talk, and then uh, we see whether we should put in some money. So, and that's how uh, MOL keeps growing, right, to different, different countries. But of course, I actually, uh, actually push him, like, say, Ganesh, you got to make this bigger, you know. Uh, One billion ringgit is, you know, in the context of where you read, what is going on overseas? Uh, we are like a real minnow. Like, all whales out there. <laughs> whales in China, whales in what? I'm sure you all hear the story of Tencent. Yeah. You know, this, uh, I think it was an uh, American uh, uh, fund, bought 50% of Tencent for 3 million when uh, the Ma Wat thing was going up, was starting it. He paid 3 million US for 50%, American fund. So this South African company offered them uh, 30 million. You pay 3 million, after 3 years somebody come and offer you 30 million. It's fantastic, you want, you want out. The guy who paid 30 million today is worth, my god, maybe 20 billion US. Probably it's worth 50, 60 billion US. US and the bring of ring yet. So these are the kind of opportunity. So I always say, uh, I always lament, I always say, oh, how come I'm not in China? How come I'm not in Silicon Valley? I could have given uh, this guy. I could all these young guys, even the Google guys, those days, I could have given them the money there. <laughs> yeah. But somehow, uh, 
what to do. My parents are here. I wasn't born in the US. I was born in China, near Ma Hua Ting, you know. <laughs> then become his partner. <laughs> No, but I think there are a lot of other Malaysian, uh, uh, you know, successful entrepreneurs like you, and really they would probably prefer to invest in, in brick and mortar companies or stuff like that, you know. But you have, have shown, of course, you've got diversified, but you've got a strong interest in the technology portfolio also. And I'm wondering where that spark came from. Is it just really from your reading, or you got into a, into a telco space, right? And then suddenly made a lot of money from there and said, hey, this telco is technology also. This space is interesting. Did it just happen by, in a way, like by uh, circumstance, you know, and not strategic? No, it is also, like I say, you know, I'm a very unfocused person. Mm -hmm. So I'm very diversified. I'm looking at all kinds of stuff, looking at new things. So sometimes I have a very wild ideas. I bring to my management and say, oh, no, 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 please don't do that. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I read a lot, and uh, that's why I thought, and then, of course, uh, you know, those days you read, you read all the valuation of those internet companies in the US and we wonder why we are not in it. So that's how uh, this wandering and whatnot. But overall, I say my experience has been excellent because I always say I'm lucky on the law average. You know, law average. You know, I always tell this guy, hey, you know, no matter how ugly you are, you ask 10 girls to go out for a date. I bet you one will go out with you. <laughs> you can be the ugliest guy, doesn't matter. If you just talk sweetly to her, ten girls, one will go out with you. Really, uh, ladies, yes? For sure, for sure, for sure. And then recently I was talking to my football coach, you know, in Cardiff, because I was telling him, you know, I, I'm not an expert in football. My people always tell me, don't tell you, don't teach you how to run or thing. But I think uh, I have a strong opinion that you must tell the players uh, to make a lot of goal attempts. So, so I said, what is goal? So he said, oh, so what do you mean? I said, I want them to shoot the ball straight into the net. Don't pass here, pass there, and always. <laughs> Actually, we're all influenced by Spain, Tiki Taka, you know, or whatever, Ting Tong. I said, you pass here, pass there, and uh, after the while, the opponent get the ball and never go near the net. <laughs> I say, you just shoot it in. I say, more goal at them. So he said, yeah, but you know, we have to do this or that. Uh, I said, never mind, you know, I'm talking about law abrasion. So I told him, no. <laughs> You know, the coach is tall, very handsome. So I said, for example, you know, I told you about this. You ask 10 girls up to date, how ugly you are, one will go out. Or oh, then he said, oh, if I ask all 10 will go out. <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, Malky, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. You are tall, you're handsome. I'm sure they all go out with you. But <laughs> I think you will, but I told you, but if you keep 10 goals, 10 won't go in, but one will go in. So I said, I want that one to go in. No? So, if you have 20 goal a time in the game, well, we have a good chance of getting at least two, you know. Okay, so it's to be aggressive, lah. Come, I got a question for you. I guess one of the questions people wanted to ask Tan Sri was that when you make investments in startups, do you always want a clear majority? Because I've heard that of you, and and what we seem to learn from the Silicon Valley is that you cannot take a majority when you are investing in a startup because then the entrepreneur loses their hunger. So you, you want to address that? No, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, not always. We can, uh, you know, I've invested in a China company, you know, this China thing. Uh, we started with 30%. We are now still about 30 over percent. And uh, same thing, like we start with 3 million and then, you know, so now it's about 17, 18 million US. So not, not, not all the time uh, we want majority. But of course, majority will be nice, and uh, and I think I'm a good investor. Or like I say, like, you know, sometimes angel turns to be non-angelic. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think over, I'm always try to be an angel over time, so that when I put in two million, you look at Ganesh, I put in two million, eventually, all in actually it cost me 90 million, but not only 90 million, in between, like for example, we buy 38 million, uh, we paid uh, Friends said 38 million. It's 100 over million ringgit. Yeah. It's 100 over million ringgit. So how do they finance it? So I put in maybe 18 million and then I asked the bank to lend me 20 million. 
Now does the bank lend me to you? Vincent Tan must sign personal guarantee, number one. Number two must also give security. You know, Malaysian bank, uh, so what? Kiasu <laughs> one. Uh. Although I do business with a lot of banks, but they all kiasu. Uh, they, that's why you go to the bank, borrow money, very susah. Uh. You need to, you know, you know, you ask your father to mortgage his bungalow, you know, not then the bank will give you some money. But you just go here, I got a great idea, I can bet you no bank gives you money. If he gives you money, he's not a bank. <laughs> no, but this guy will give you money here. Yeah. Okay, good. That's it. I guess before I move on to Jonathan, just one question. When you said, uh, you know, uh, when entrepreneurs come to you and if you, want, if you want to invest in an entrepreneur, what is it that you look for in the entrepreneur before you decide, yes, I can bet on them? Because we seem to be told that at the end of the day, an angel makes uh, a, a investment because they think this entrepreneur has it, you know, has what it takes to succeed. What do you look for in that entrepreneur? Well, <clears throat> you know, like I said earlier, of course we want commitment. And we want to make sure that the guy is not collecting too much salaries that he, you know, he's starting it so that he gets himself paid, pay himself. You know, some people do that. Some investing, some investment we see, or they start, they say, oh, my old job, I get paid 100,000, so I must be paid 100,000. <laughs> you know, so if like this, huh, if you look at this kind of thing, then you say, oh, this, this guy is not as committed as he should be. You must take a pay cut, be willing to rub it out and then build the business. That's how business can be built. Like. You build a business on luxury, I still want a driver, I want you know, a big car and you know, all the luxury. So these are important factors. Like. But at least you know that you know, you're you not going to pay a lot, invest a lot and half of it every month goes to their, all their salaries. And, you know. So this is one of the consideration. But having said all that, uh, finally, we have to bet on the law of average. <coughs> because some may tell you, show you impressive plan. Plans are always impressive. Even who gives you a plan is not impressive. You don't go to sell someone that plan is not impressive. You want to promise the sky. You know? you know, right? You say, oh my problem, if like, you invest this, I think in five years time this can be worth 500 million. You know? Of course everybody tells you how fantastic it will be. And then you have to make that call. And, uh, and of course, if we are confident, if it's just, you know, we are the only one that he wants to invest with him, naturally we want a majority uh, so that we can, so that uh, they will listen to the angel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've had issues where the, the entrepreneur doesn't listen to your, your angelic advice. La. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Sure, I mean, you know, some of these uh, startups, all these people, they come from all these, uh, you know, so they're all very smart. So now the time they listen to their advice because maybe, maybe they say, I don't understand the space. You know, maybe, you know, I'm 60 years old, you know, this space is for 30 to 40 and whatnot, or 20 plus, you know. But uh, believe me, uh, I may not what, but I read a lot and I understand the space. Uh, but uh, it's sometimes, of course, we don't make the right call, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess let me now move over the mic to, to Jonathan and, and have him share with us, you know, what are some of the insights, you know, and, and uh, some clarity like, on this uh, government, you know, ruling that, or, or it, it's not really a ruling, like, it's, it's, it's going to be a piece of legislation, I guess, right, that will encourage angel investors to come in. So I'll uh, pass him the mic and then we'll move back. Uh, we've got another 35 minutes because uh, we want to end this in an hour. And then we can, uh, Tan Sri has agreed to mingle with you guys uh, and you know, you can uh, do your thing and uh, impress him and then the, he's going to have a, just a short interview with SME Magazine like I said. So uh, Jonathan, I'll just pass you the mic from behind Tan Sri. Yeah. Pardon Tan Sri. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I don't know whether... No, and I, I just realized it's one thing, is true. They said when you gain a Tan Sri or Dato Ship, you lose your name because nobody calls you by your name. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, Thanks, uh, very insightful information, Tantri. Um, if you don't mind, I can call you Vincent. Sure, please. Like, yeah. <laughs> no uh, they but call me that overseas all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, well, a little bit about the tax incentives, so you know the budget uh, that was announced by the PM recently uh, announced that there was going to be a tax incentives for individual investors. Uh, now, 
the nitty gritty details are not been finalised yet. It will be finalised by the Ministry of Finance and Lambaga Hasil uh, So whatever I say today doesn't really matter. So it will change anyway. But we do hope we do hope uh, to see some positive outcome from it. Uh, we've been lobbying for the tax incentive, as in Crater has been lobbying for a little over two and a half years now. So, uh, so we were very pleased to see it announced. Um, and when we lobbied for it, we were actually after not necessarily high net worth individuals like country, but actually more of the masses, people who are more high income individuals who have some residual income that they would like to invest or diversify their investment from the more traditional like uh, property or even the listed stocks uh, in Bursa into more private equity. Uh, it's very high risk, we understand that, and that's why we push for the tax incentives. So we are gunning for people with high income. What's the definition? I mean, it's like 170,000, 200,000 you know, uh, gross income a year and you qualify? So we're, we're looking at somewhere in the range of about 180,000 uh, per annum. Uh, 15,000 a month salary? Like it's about 15,000. So uh, the minimum investment we are hoping for is about 5,000 per individual and can go up to about half a million. So these are things that are on our wish list. Whether it's approved or not, it depends highly on the powers that be. Yeah. I guess one question I already get asked is if you invest in a startup and if it fails after three years mm -hmm. and you put in half a million, mm -hmm. so can you then uh, claim back the full half a million against your personal income tax then? Uh, and over a period so of it's, years? It's one, one for one investment. So if you invest a ringgit, doesn't matter how much you invest, but up to a maximum of half a million. So that's that's what you can claim back. And over a few years, right? You can claim yeah. over a few years. Oh, that's well, that that, uh, that that is has to be finalized by MOF. Uh, but there is a two-year withholding period uh, because on our side they are also concerned with fraud. Okay. So the investors need to hold the share and add value to the company for a period of two years before then before they claim back. Okay, but you can only claim back, I guess, if the uh, investment has failed, right? It's not if you make money, right? No, right? if the company is successful, you can still claim back. Still back, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, so, that's, so that's, uh, that's what we're hoping for because, amazing. We, I mean, uh, like what Tantri says, law of average. So we want more people to invest in more companies, therefore creating more successes. Hey, but and you're now giving more competition to a, a, a hardcore <laughs> angel like Tan Sri. No? <laughs> I'm sure Tan Sri is always looking for you know, qualified investors to partner up with who can add value in the company. We don't, we're not just looking for people with money, we're looking for people who have the financial ability and also the value add into the company. So just having uh, 180,000 per annum is insufficient. We need to be able to add value to come either uh, opening up your network if you have Tantri's network it'll be great yeah. or even adding value like Tantri gives advice to the company those are the type of angels we are actually after people who are professional and have this high income that can add value and invest in companies okay. I guess I'm going to open it up to the crowd also if there are any questions right so uh, we've got a couple more questions but please free put up your hand and, and maybe this high tech high tech mic will work out there away from the other mic right so if anyone has a question, you know, just grab the mic and okay, the, bu the button is underneath there. It's already on. Okay, just pass it at the bottom. Just try and you get push a question. Just identify yourself and then uh, obviously got a couple more questions for Tanji. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Farhan from Rich Publishing. Okay. Uh, I was wondering what you were thinking about these new uh, crowdsourcing investments like Kickstarter and all that. Do they? Have, is it part of your plans and all? So say that again. Uh, the crowdsourcing, like Kickstarter, with um, micro investments. Okay. That's many people uh, put in an investment because they like a company. So every, like he's saying, it's, it's a form of angel investing, but you put in very little money. Everyone gets a piece of their company and shares, lah, not percentage. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we can look at it. Uh, talk to Ganesh. Uh, talk to Kenneth. If you don't know Kenneth Chang, uh, Kinetics. Uh, Talk to my people, they can bring it to me, or you can send me an email. You, can, you know, I will look and then I will ask my guys to talk to you all direct. Sure, we look at all kinds of stuff. We are willing to put some money here, some money there. Like I say, like, you know, diversify. And then we hope we have, as we have more experience, we have our, let's say, our betting average goes up. Goes up yeah. Hopefully, our, our goal attempts score more goal. <laughs> okay, yeah. 
I get that. I'm gonna ask you a question after I go to Jonathan. But the question I'll ask you: Just think of of the of the craziest pitch that an entrepreneur has given to you. You know that in the end, then you decided not to, but which was actually crazy. What do you think of that, uh, Jonathan? In terms of the angel scenario in this country, I guess we all tend to think that there are not enough angels. And really, actually, even when I was in Singapore, entrepreneurs there say the same thing. You know, it's ironic. And, and just like we complain about education system here, you, you find even uh, people in the West complain about their own education system. So this is one of those things that there's never enough. So what, what is your perspective of, of at least within the region, right? Because then of course, like if Doc Sifa is here, he'll tell you about that Singapore company, Crystal Horse, that has made seven investments in Malaysian tech companies, right? Yeah. So you hear that and you say, hey, you know, there is, it's stronger there. Yeah. So yeah. Well, Crystal House is here. Kelvin, can you just stand up? <laughs> so go to him for money. Uh, so, well, yeah, Kelvin make is, a detour here first. Then. <laughs> well, Kelvin is also part of Virtuous Investment Circle, which is a small little angel club that, that we are we are both part of. Um, there's a small numbers of uh, in, in angel members in that club. So obviously, being a small club, the amount of deals that they can see and bet through and invest is somewhat limited. But VIC, according to Bob, in the last uh, year or since they kicked started in 20F, has made more than 10 million worth of investment uh, in various different types of startups. Um, so the investors are there. And then you have groups like Bitcoin Angel uh, Chapter, you have uh, uh, AIPO, uh, Business Angel Club. Um, those are various clubs they are currently in, in Klang Valley, also, also some parts of Malaysia. And, and then those of you who disagree with Jonathan, please challenge him. Huh? Just because he's got the mic doesn't mean yeah. he cannot be challenged. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are angel investors around. And then, of course, there are individuals like Tan Sri who are, are always looking for the next big thing that he can put his money in. It's whether you can get to these guys and you can convince them that you are worth the money. You know, So you can't just go and wait for the, the money to fall on your lap. It doesn't happen. Um, so I always encourage entrepreneurs to go out, network, you know, you know, talk to people who can then introduce. You may not know Tan Sri, but eventually, law of average away or six degrees of separation, somebody will know somebody will know somebody who can then eventually no, introduce you to Tan Sri. No, you can send me your email. Then oh, we'll read it. Your email? I'll read it. What's the right? Okay, Tan Sri, what's your email? TSVT at Bajaya.com.my The whole world has it now. The whole world has it now. So just, just send an email and then we'll look at it. I, you know, I read all my emails. So of course, not those, uh, there's a lot of crap email, but scan, uh, what do you call that? So we don't read. But people will send in and we really talk about a proposal. We'll look at it. Uh, I think someone sent me one. He's here today. He says he would like to meet me. Well, you know, we can meet. So. Just send me, send an email, then you know, I look at it, and I pass to one of my guys to say, follow up, find out more, and then, you know, we can never know what happened. But actually, I want to add, actually, in Malaysia, there are a lot of uh, angel investors. I think many people invest, except that sometimes it's low profile, they're not, people don't get to know. Like, uh, for example, you know, Dato Vincent Lee of Star, he invested in this uh, soft space, which then, uh, uh, now MOL has joined venture with them, you know. So there is, there are a lot, except that maybe some are still out there, not ready or low profile, or they'll be very profitable and not many people know. So, so if you say investors, I think the, uh, angel investors, plenty. It's just that anyone with money is just going to approach them, you know. Most people, you know, observation those who continue want to do more business. Lah. Some of money they want to play golf every day, so maybe, <laughs> maybe that one they may not be so keen. <laughs> so there are still a lot of people who will who, who want to invest. So just have to make make the call. Just make the call. Uh, yeah. I guess just DNA's own personal experience when when we wanted to launch, we went to an angel, and I asked guy for eight hundred thousand ringgit, yeah, and instinctively his reaction was that uh, for that amount of money, I can invest in a high-end property and I can go to sleep three years later, and this is almost his words, so for once as a journalist, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> so say I can wake, you know, after three years, I can wake up and I know I would have made money on that investment, whereas if I give you the money, I'll be worried every day whether you're making the right decisions or this and that. I thought, wow, this thing you hear about people comparing an investment in an entrepreneur with investing in property, right? It's really true, man. It's not some, you know, hype thing. So I was amazed. Yeah, no. 
at the end of the day, investment in properties are low hanging fruits, right? So in a developing country like Malaysia, those are still prevalent. Um, so uh, what I would always tell uh, high net worth people that I meet is, uh, as a good or smart investor, you want to diversify your portfolio. Uh, and again, is if they if that guy was just to invest in yours, of course he won't sleep every day. Again, back to the law of the he need to split his investment into several several different uh, companies at different industries, different stages, where he knows that one of it will then return uh, his investment. So I mean, the the risk and reward are there. Uh, I'm sure Tanshui has a fair share of failures, but for those that succeed, like M1, it's very rewarding, not just financially, but you learn as well as you're deep growing with the company. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Anji, do you have an anecdote of an entrepreneur, the craziest business plan or proposal you you know you receive and you said no? I think there's so many, I can't remember. There's so many because I really get a lot of, uh, yeah, there are many and I can't remember uh, which is the craziest. When you don't do it, means some are quite crazy, yeah. I guess, okay, uh, a question is if your your fellow, your friends, right, there's a question I had, they ask you whether they want to be, if they want to be an angel investor, what would your advice be to them? No, I think I would advise them that, you know, you have surplus money, you have already invested, you're a wealthy person, you should invest because you help to start, you know, create employment in the country, you give our young people, you know, a chance, maybe one day we will have a, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg here, you know, we have the, you know, the Google founders, you know. So, those who are wealthy should and give the young people a chance. Uh, after all, uh, when, I was, when I started out, so there are people who helped me along the way. And that's why, I, I, you know, I make it. And of course, uh, you have to put in a lot of effort and like I say you got to be lucky too. And then there are people who give you a, give you a helping hand along the way. So, so, you, so I would advise uh, my wealthy friends to, they should look and invest and, uh, and you can never know, you can hit something really big. And like I said, you know, I put in 200 million, so it looks like I lose most of it. But then two or three that survives will more than pay for what I've invested over the years. I mean, I put 200 million and uh, maybe another 80, 90 million, so maybe 280. But today what I have invested in this space, just the internet, I don't, don't talk about the telco. Telco, so. yeah. telco is different than that is so it's probably worth about maybe you know 1.3, 1.4 billion in value in value. So it's done very well. I mean it's over the years it's paid very well over 12, 13 years, 12 years, you know. But I did uh, I did very well in the in the telco business, different. but that is different. Uh. That was big capital, you gotta put a big capital and take a lot of risks, you know, yeah. I guess if, uh, uh, one question I had is, if somebody comes to you and they have failed before as an entrepreneur before, and they're giving you a proposal or, you know, and uh, would you consider investing in somebody who you know has failed before? What, what would you say and do? Because obviously, you know, in the Silicon Valley, they probably say, the more times you have failed, you fail on other people's money, and you've picked up all that learning and that experience, right? And you're better prepared then to run your next venture, whether it's your fourth or your fifth. And we, we are led to believe that, you know, people will more be, be more willing to invest in you because you obviously still have the passion, you're out there doing something. Well, I think uh, it looks at his late, well, well, what I'll do, I'll look at his latest proposal and then find out what he, what he has failed and why he failed now. And then probably if his latest proposal is interesting, doesn't matter that he has failed. Now. I think it's nothing wrong with failure. I mean, if you don't want to, if you, if you want to, if you are afraid to fail, you will not try. You will not go out and do it. You will not quit your job and, you know. And I always remember this when I was starting out, I read this uh, book. I read this uh, saying by, uh, I think it was uh, President Roosevelt. I think it was him. Like, he said this. And this quote stuck in my mind. And, <clears throat> and uh, I remember it so well, I can quote it. To you all now, verbal team almost. <clears throat> this, this is what he said. He said, far better it is to dare mighty things. 
to win glory, uh, to win glorious triumph, than to take rank with those poor spirit who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, and who does not know the difference between victory and defeat, victory and defeat, and between uh, uh, success and failure. So basically, this 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 quote is to tell you, go for it. Don't be afraid that you will fail, because uh, at least you also taste failure and understand failure, and it'll make you a better person, more resilient after that. So failure isn't, uh, you know, you fail once doesn't mean uh, it's the end of the world. And there are some people who have gone bankrupt. Well, bankrupt business okay, like, I mean, <laughs> no bankrupt spending credit card. <laughs> going to nightclub, signing bills, go bankrupt, that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, bankrupt in business is okay. They go and bankrupt, their business don't do well, they go bust. They're given a chance again, they will come back. So, like I said, I always remember this, uh, this saying. And uh, so, remember what I said about this saying. I think that generally was very inspiring for me. It's great. But then, to play the devil's advocate, that when you're a successful entrepreneur with, with the same saying, right, wouldn't you, but you have hundreds, thousands of people working for you who they're not there, right? They, they're not right. They're comfortable in there. So, do you then internally challenge your people to say, hey, I will find you if you come up with something interesting or crazy to go out and do? Because you hear that of the, of the big tech companies, right? They try to build entrepreneurs from within. Have you ever done that within the group itself? Yeah, of course. Uh to what I said just now is when you have made it, when you have made it, uh, of course, uh, we want to uh, hash our, our risk better. Uh. We don't want to put everything into a basket and risk it all. Uh. But uh, having said that, uh, you know, I was very, uh, very impressed. In the last two days, I read about uh, SoftBank uh, going to buy uh, by Sprint in the US. Yeah, but the share price 20, is getting killed. Right? 20 billion US dollars. But just remember this. This is Maya Yoshi's son. Um, uh, I think I met him once. Just remember this. In 2006 or 2005, around 2005, maybe 2006, six years ago, he bought Vodafone once to exit Japan. He bought, he bought Vodafone for 15 billion US. The whole investment community in Japan say he's crazy, he's going to fail. He did so well and uh, he's very big. He became the second richest man in Japan, you know, ranking by Forbes. Uh. And uh, today he's taking this back. And his stock price has dropped maybe 10 or 20% in the last few days while he was contemplating this. Does it deter him? No, it doesn't. He pressed forward, and my gut feel is he will make it. He will do well. He will make it because uh, what Sprint need is an entrepreneur like him who has taken this kind of bet and made it, and he can bring the same talent, manage managerial skill that he has, and entrepreneurial skill to make Sprint work. You know, but you'd be surprised. Sprint may one day overtake AT and T, or at least Sprint will be a strong number two or number three. Number three, it will be profitable. So he's like uh, almost, although he's not totally betting the house, but he's almost like, like betting the house because he's still got debt in his company and he's taking on uh, paying 15 billion and that company has got debts also. So if you add it all up, you think this is crazy. And the man is worth eight, nine billion. Why is he doing all that? Maybe he must be Thinking of Ted Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just maniacally driven, I guess. But that's great. Hey, you know what? We have already picked up some interesting insight from Tan Sri. First, he's given us all a scoop, right, in journalism par uh, parlance. Because he said that he just got the valuation for MOL, you know, which is 1 billion ringgit. I'm sure Ganesh may not have been too happy for that to be shared in the room of 200 people and uh, however how many people watching. <laughs> so that's great. And also the fact that uh, he's also given us a stock tip, right? I mean, if you want to invest now, you go and buy SoftBank because their share price yeah. I've been watching is tanking. I think so. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think you have extra cash if you go and buy SoftBank shares. 
I think it will do well maybe in you know, 06, maybe about five years time, maybe it will double, triple, who knows, you know. But he's quite a guy, I mean, if you read about software and what he has done, he's incredible. And he's pretty young too, I think. He's maybe now about 50, early 50. Yeah. You know, he's pretty young. Well, pretty young because he's been around so long. Yes, true, true. <laughs> okay, guys, you got any more questions? Because we will wrap up in 10 minutes, okay? Uh, we've got, uh, yeah, okay, hold on. Evelyn here. Uh, can you get the high, super duper high tech sensor mic? <laughs> Actually, this question actually has to do with your thinking on whether people will pay for education here for self-directed learning. You talked about English and the weaknesses here in, in Malaysia, perhaps in Asia. We know things like Khan's Academy, Rehan School is quite popular in other places. But here people seem to like to go to classes. What if we put education on the web? Would well, do you think it is viable that people would actually pay to learn for themselves? Okay, okay just a quick one then. Uh, a question I want to ask the audience before Tantri answers. Uh, think of an angel uh, experience you have had, and if you're willing to share that, right, share that and, and get Tantri's take on, on what he thinks of that situation, yeah? That would be interesting if, some, if someone can share that, okay? No, I think, uh, sure. I mean, uh, people will pay, but you know, Problem in the net, people don't want to pay too much. There's so many free stuff on the net. So people won't pay too much. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, if it's a compelling, uh, what you can convince people, of course, if uh, all the, uh, most of the students for this, uh, fortunately, are the lower income. So actually what I have done is I've got this uh, young man here. Uh, Raj, would you like to stand up? Raj Singh, his father, is an incredible man. His father and uh, both he and his brothers, uh, they actually set up free school, uh, schools to teach people English and they call it SOS, uh, SOL 24-7. SOS stands for Science of Life 24-7. But their focus is on English. Now I've always felt that, <clears throat> you know, a lot of us, most of us here, we are so fortunate that we have the benefit of an English uh, medium of uh, schooling you know? and we you know you go up to form five your english is pretty good you can read and write so you can learn a lot you know i always say that you know in the internet uh, if you don't know english wow it's a real big handicap can you imagine if malaysia will try to translate all the information in the internet to malay and then the, what the malay have written to english maybe we need 500,000 translators. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe not so many. <laughs> where do you find even 100,000 translators? Where do you get them? So the reality is English is so important. So I'm trying to contribute because I thought I'm blessed in this. I would like to give back. So one of the thing is uh, I found this organization. You know, they did an incredible uh, job of uh, teaching people English. And the father actually went to Cambodia because he thought Malaysia doesn't need it. And they did. They helped so many people in Cambodia, then they went to Papua New Guinea. So they also have in Malaysia. I mean, the father could have been a wealthy man, but he just wanted to do this. So I truly admire the father. So my foundation, I got a foundation called Better Malaysia Foundation. Last year I chose his father as a personality of the year, and I gave the father 500,000 ringgit as a cash award. You know what the father did with the 500,000? He gave most of, way to, most of it away to his teachers and volunteers. <laughs> so what, what they did is they bring in, uh, for example, a lot of students. I went to, they have a school here in Skam, uh, Skambun. They have 100 students who stay there. And most of them after Form 5 or SPM. They are people from Oral Asli, they are from Sabah, Sarawak, and all low income people. They come, they can't speak English. After six months, they all can speak very fluent English. They have got this program, it's an like English immersion. And then they make it, uh, you know, you'll be fine if you speak anything other than English. So they come in, they have to struggle with English, they must speak English. That's a fantastic program. So I say, you are, this is the party that I'm looking towards to help me in uh, spreading English, to help more people in this country speak English. So I pledge to give them 10 million. 
so they have uh, they didn't really spend that much one maybe a million now I said go and build more center you know then maybe we can we can donate more money and then I can later get some other people to donate you know so we at least complement uh, what the government is trying to do now also because we all know that education policy is um, very sensitive to talk about it but uh, so <clears throat> so regarding what you say about English I, 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 I'm sure the people will pay for it but uh, unfortunately those who need it uh, are the people in the kampong in the what you know in Klang Valley most people that middle income and upper middle income will be able to send their children uh, some to private school or at least give them tuition English tuition and then some even to send them to Chinese school or national school, Malay school, a Malay medium school. Parents speak English at home. So some children grow up thinking their mother tongue is actually English. <laughs> a lot of us speak English with our children. You know? And for some of my children, they, they only speak uh, our dialect is Hokkien only with my grandma. <laughs> with those who don't speak English. So, so to what is you know, what I think people will pay but not too much and the problem is low-income people so maybe if you come with a program like this some people have to fund them you know and unfortunately uh, it is so sad you know that <clears throat> the future poor boys out there in the village that I was when I was young would not be able to have this opportunity of the benefit of a good English medium schooling it's a bit unfortunate and I always say it's very important and I say to every country I go you know I want to relate to you I went to Vietnam and met the president of Vietnam early days when we were investing in Vietnam about four or five years ago so the president was telling me you know we thank you for investing we in, in Vietnam we need a lot of jobs for people we have too many people so he said we are, we are going to hit almost 90 million with too many people. So you know what I'm doing? I said, Mr. President, to me, people is an asset. I always, I tell him, you know, can you imagine uh, if China only had 100 million? I think you are not afraid of China. <laughs> can you imagine if China only had 100 million people? China would be so rich. You know, they have full employment long time ago already. They are 100 million people. They have 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 billion. So I see you have great asset. You know, 90 million, that's why we like your country. Think of the 90 million consumer down the road as opposed to 28 million here. And I say that, but Mr. President, one thing you must do, you should make your people here bilingual. They should learn English. They should learn, of course, you want to teach them Vietnamese. That's a national language. Everybody wants to do that. But you must make them bilingual. You must teach English side by side with uh, your Vietnamese. And can you imagine if all your people are bilingual, they can speak English, they can speak Vietnamese, your country will be great. You don't have to worry about employment. The world is the employment. They can go anywhere, they can get employed. Look at the Filipinos. Anywhere they'll be employed. You go on a boat cruise, everybody is Filipino. <laughs> you go there, Filipinos. So you now. So they don't have to worry, but if you are just, you don't know that you know, the Vietnamese will come and work here, what can they do? They just have to stay in the factory, do that thing. What else can they do? Because they don't know English. So how important English is, you know? Yeah. So that's why in my, you know, because I say I'm blessed and we should always give back to society after we have done well. I always believe in that long, long time ago. And so I said, what a way to contribute is this language, this English language. So that we, if we make them all at least can speak, can, you know, and uh, later read and write a bit better. They all can read and write, but speaking is a problem. So after we get that, a lot of them will become more employable. The hotel industry will prefer to hire Malaysians if it can. Why would you want to employ Filipinos? They prefer to employ Malaysians. But now a lot of Malaysians don't speak English properly. And you go to the resort, they don't speak English, they try to avoid the guests <laughs> because they are so shy. Yes. You know, and then the guests say, your hotel service is lousy. I see your guests, they are so shy, so afraid because they don't speak English. So we are trying to do that. We just started the English program in Dioman. 
in Redang. You know, it was so heartwarming. I was in Tioman this last weekend. My general manager was telling me, you know, there are many housewives learning English. So we also teach housewives learning English. They also come and learn. So they have housewives, then they have adults at night, then they have school children after class coming. And we set that up. You know, we sold 24. And uh, Raj, could, Raj, Raj uh, managed to get even volunteers from overseas, from Europe. We have, they got European. And Raj just told me, I had a meeting with Raj today on how to expedite our program. Raj was telling me, if they bring European, I say it's very strange, you know. They bring European to the school, to, to, the, aid, to the centre to teach. The enrollment goes up. <laughs> so I said, Raj, you must be good looking European. <laughs> No, it's just a perception issue we had. I guess, is the mic with somebody who wants to share an angel story with Tan Sri? Uh, somebody hands up so the mic can be passed, anyone? No, do you have a question? Just a question. Okay, so, uh, you can use the mic. And I guess, just before you ask the question, Tan Sri, how important is gut feel for you when you're going to invest? Because well? you hear that a lot so much, right? And oh, you just said something about... That was uh, my question. Oh, that was your question. question. <laughs> okay, okay, then I'll ask him something else. Okay, okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate you because clearly, your support for the entrepreneurs is more than just making money. It's it's altruistic. It's helping people, and that's that's a great thing. I suspect you're also having a lot of fun too. So I guess we factor that in. Uh, Paul Graham of Y Combinator wrote a really good article the other week talking about how he's looked at so many investments and occasionally things come by him that don't make any sense at all. And a lot of the VC community talk about that that some of the, the not obvious investments just pass them by because they feel strange, they don't stack up and they let them go. But the community is starting to look more carefully at those things, thinking just because it doesn't feel right, let's not just turn our back on it. So I'm just wondering in your experience, does that come past you where something comes across you and maybe intuitively you feel it's interesting, but maybe even the managers are saying, leave it alone. You know? So how do you, how do you cope with that? Oh, one thing I learned over the years, don't listen to your finance manager. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, to be fair, not all the time. <laughs> you know, for example, I tell you, this is not an internet business. Uh, you know, I was negotiating to buy 7-Eleven here in the year 2000. So they were asking for 18 million. So they make about 300,000. So they have 140 shops. So my, my finance guy goes, oh, how can we pay 80 million for 300,000? One eight or eight zero? One eight zero. Oh, eight, eight zero. zero. Eight zero make 300,000 profit. You know? <laughs> make 300,000 profit. How can you pay 80 million? That's what he wants and there's got other guys waiting. There's another a guy waiting, a foreigner waiting. You know, so maybe the foreigner, if you don't buy foreigner, you knock him down a bit. Yeah. But he wants 80 million. So my financial guy said, no way. It's too high. It's too many times PE and what PE. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, hmm, yeah. But how about we buy it and then we double the profit every year? No, oh, how can you double profit? I said, maybe if we are lucky, we will double the profit. So. 300,000, 80 million is what? How many times P? It's 200, uh, 300, 250 over times P. So if you double it, then it's 125. You double again, maybe. You know? So I say, oh, maybe we can make it work. Uh, but I say, you know, we buy this for long term. We buy long term. We build, we build, the, the, build the business. And one of the things I say is, we want to buy, we to open a lot of shops and make it work. And we did that. So we paid 80 million. I paid 80 million. You know, then I um, did one of those silly things, you know, <laughs> go and lease it for 600 million. And after seven months, I said, oh my God, I made a mistake. So I took it back and paid them 30% more. So I, it's the seven months, they all get 30% more. They're all very happy. But I was like an idiot, but never mind. <laughs> I decided that, no, I think I want to keep it. And if I keep it a few more years, build, say, a few thousand stores, it should be worth a couple of billions. A couple of billions. And I think it's happening. Yeah. It's happening because you're the dominant one, you're the... 
you are the first mover, you are like Astro, no? You are the only one. You are the biggest. So you pay a lot for it. So on that basis, uh, this is what, if I have listened to the financial guy, you won't buy it. Or you go to tell me, hey, no, uh, 80, no way, man. How about 50? 50, he tell you to take a walk. Man. <laughs> so, today your question. Uh, so, gut feel is also important. It's also gut feel. Uh. Of course, it's not, you can't double the profit every year. But I'm just saying, it just, if I double, it just, but we'll try to make it work. But the gut feel is, I think we can make this work. You know, this is needed in more places, but they didn't, they are, the previous owner was not aggressive. <coughs> didn't open a lot of stores. We open a lot of stores, this company will be worth more. And it actually is true. So, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I actually have a question yeah. So, um, we know that you've invested in quite a number of companies, but for every company that you invest in, how many uh, companies have you sidelined or bypassed? I mean, just to get an average on, you know, investment versus those that fail to get investment. Maybe about, maybe out of the proposal we see, maybe we invest in about maybe 20, 30%. So maybe we see 10, we invest two or three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I'm more optimistic, maybe. So I try more goal attempts. <laughs> well, the, the reason I came to that question was, at, at the end of the day, to, to get the right investor, it's like the willing buy, willing sell thing. So for entrepreneur side, going to 10 investors may not be sufficient. So as an entrepreneur, you need to go to as many investors as possible. It may be 20, 30 investors before you hit the right investor who is willing to bet on you. So that's, that's the case. So don't give up when you were able to 10, and then say no, and say, oh, okay, there's really no investors here. You need to go up uh, as often as possible to get investors. And also, uh, I must add, you also need to be lucky, like, because not only after they invest, they've got to continue, you've got to find an investor that will continue to want to hold your hand and take you all the way. So I think in Ganesh's case, uh, in the, in the other investment that still stays with me and doing well. Uh, I continue to hold their hands and on and off they'll come and say, you know, there's this thing, how about putting two, three million, should we invest this, should we do this, and study the thing. I say, what do you guys think? You guys say, oh no, I think we should invest. Okay, then let's do it. We'll put it none. So you gotta, for Ghana, you be able to build, I mean, realistically, two million, build a one billion company. It's possible, but tough. Like. But in this case, is I keep putting in money over the years until eventually my net investment is in and now I almost have a net investment there of 90 million. But very often I put myself at credit, put my credit on the line. I'm willing to, to go and some, you know, go and take a loan. I sign as the guarantor. If I sign guarantor, the bank will give the money because anything goes wrong, the bank asks me I will have to pay up. So, so you must if you have a investors who continue to hold your hand and want to in, continue to invest, then you have a better chance of building a big, bigger company. Because the initial investment may not be enough. You know, the initial investment, they may put two million, five million, and then after that, it runs out, and then what are you going to do? You're going to close shop? So you can't close shop if you still want to save your original investment, so you put in more money. But in the Ganesh case, it's just that we want to expand. Uh, not that, you know, they were really, we want to expand and so we keep buying new things from uh, buying different companies, buy a company in Thailand, buy a company in Vietnam, buy a company in uh, India, in the uh, Philippines, you know, and now all over, now going to Brazil, going to Turkey, US, so. I think Brazil, you make sure Ganesh doesn't go during the Rio festival, la. <laughs> <laughs> then he's not there for business. <laughs> okay, I guess we, we need to end this now. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, Doc Siva has question or monologue? Question. Question, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, no. couldn't help it. Uh, Doc Siva is great. Uh. Hi, Tan Sri. Uh, yeah, good to have you here. Sorry, uh, uh, Doc Siva is one of the leaders in the in the, in the the startup internet community in Malaysia. Also. Oh, okay. Thank you, Karam. Yeah. Uh, Tan Sri is slightly different from angels and so on. I'm just a little bit more interested in, in your motivations. 
uh, you came from a very poor family. So when you were young, what was it that motivated you? I mean, you went into business and so on. What motivated you when you were young? And now that you know you have more money than you can spend, you're already a multi-billionaire, you have so much money and you just retired. What motivates you today? When you wake up, what is it that you know you do when you wake up? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know when you're poor, it's easy to be motivated, isn't it? <laughs> You don't have to ask, right? <laughs> yeah. So you know the answer. Uh, but I was blessed, you know, uh, in a way. Actually, I was supposed uh, to go to New Zealand to study. Then that year, my father failed in his business. He's a small contractor. He failed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but my father and mother still said, never mind, you go, we'll, make, we'll somehow sort it out. I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I said, no way I'm going while you are struggling. <clears throat> so I went, I came out and worked, and then, you know. So that was great motivation. And then uh, nowadays, um, well, you know, retirement is, uh, I actually retired from the public listed company, but I'm still giving advice and helping. Uh, you know, like uh, Tun, Tun Mahathir always joke, he's the British advisor, and I'm like the British advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so we tell the management, you have to take the British advisor advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> now I'm motivated, uh, well, I still want to make money, uh, but I've uh, pledged to give uh, half my wealth away. I think uh, some of you have heard of it. And I'm trying to uh, do more charities work. Like this English thing is uh, is charity, like for the community, you know. And it's for Malaysian. Uh, and of course, we hope to take it to other countries as we can, uh, as we grow. Actually, you shouldn't say charity. This English thing is empowerment, you know. So sure, yeah, yeah, but it is, of course, with the aim to help the community. And and I pledge to to. Uh, Rush father that I'll give 10 million. You spend it and then I will come up, you know. To spend it means you have to build a lot of centers. So they are they are rushing to build centers. So we will, and hopefully uh, a lot of uh, people who go to the national medium, you know, Malay medium, when they come out, they go to this place, then they get to speak English well, and then hopefully all of them will get better jobs. And that will also, we hope it will motivate them to then continue to study and improve their English. And I think that would be that would be good for all of us, lah. Because we need all these people to work one day. We want to hire people who can speak English, so that we can communicate with them. We tell them go to the net and check this, check that. If you don't know English, how to check? <laughs> so, so by by uh, helping more people to speak and learn English well, we will indirectly all of us help ourselves in the long term, you know. And uh, so that's one of my big motivation, and of course, we try to help charities here and there. And uh, and uh, I said when I make the announcement, I said nowadays we are overwhelmed with requests. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether I did the right thing or not. <laughs> but uh, we'll try to manage and help whatever we can and what we think is deserving, cause deserving uh, individuals. Yeah. I guess great. I think we will uh, end, end here now. I think all of us here, we're, we're, I, I think we could be a part of history or so because I think it's the first time that I know of at least a, 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 a billionaire, you know, def not even just in Malaysia, maybe in Southeast Asia has, has done a Google Hangout thingy, you know. So, Bikesh, do you think so? Yes. So, really, all of you are, are part of history here. But thanks to Tan Sri. Thanks to all of you also for coming and for listening. And I guess Tan Sri has given us a bit of a tip also. If you want to get some money from him because he's a Hokkien, right? You go and Kong Hokkien Wat Tampu Tampu. I think you're all doing No, speak English. <laughs> okay, you pass. I'll just test it. Yeah.